All right, many delinquent borrowers who are in loss mitigation are not paying. Doesn't that kind of blow the whole housing narrative up, I guess? I don't know. Well, let's talk about that in a second here. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is the 2nd of March, new month. Hope you're doing well. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate because that's what we need these days. A lot of stuff going on in the world, a lot of distractions. I get it, but you know what? Things are starting to happen under the radar in the real estate world, and that's um, you know bodes well for the future if you really want to get into it. So having said that, this video is brought to you by my friends at foreclosure.com. So if you look, if you want to find out what is going on in your neck of the woods, the distressed properties, the pre-foreclosures, REOs, probates, um, you know, tax deeds, whatever, all the distressed property, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com. Com. It'll take you to uh, my affiliate link and you can check out what's happening in your area. Again, a lot of these things uh, that we talk about will manifest and will be off market opportunities using a data service um, uh, like foreclosure.com will certainly help you find out where those deals are. So again, get housingdata.com. I appreciate that. So let's get into it now and um, let's do a quick recap. Okay, housing market review. And I think it's important to set the stage to talk about this because you know, I look at it going, it's a shell game out there. It's kind of like, look over here, don't look over there, don't listen to what we're saying, don't don't investigate, everything's fine, everything's good. Well, that narrative, I think, is coming to an end. I think I'm pretty much tired of it. I don't care. I know what's going to happen. I'm already going down that path. For people who, who are interested, I think it's going to make an impact in the near future. So, you know, don't forget, we had, I guess we could say we've had about a two-year choke on delinquent or, or distressed properties being available. Why? Because of various moratoria out there, eviction moratoria, foreclosure moratoria, state level moratoriums, county level moratoriums, all sorts of things going on. Well, now that we're in 2022, we're pretty much over virtually any sort of restriction on the distressed properties, even the forbearance. People are coming out of their forbearance programs since the end of July. So we have delinquencies, we have forbearance people, we have people in foreclosure, okay? Now, this is the, the difficulty, is, is what do we do with that volume and what is that volume? Well, you know, I've heard everything from about 3 million potential mortgages or homes all the way to over 10 million. That's the range of what I'm hearing from different people. And these are not, these are smart people who are giving their, you know, their predictions are two cents worth their intel for what they have it so three to ten million that's a pretty big number let's just say cut it in, in the middle seven and a half million that's kind of what i'm thinking somewhere in that range will be available is it an ambiguous number yes it is it's tough to pen down and actually kind of figure out because there's not one place to get statistics the problem with statistics and i'm not you know going to knock the people who are providing them because it is helpful but we know that they're usually underreported. they're either conservative numbers they're based on extrapolations from samples of samples, etc., trying to give us some sort of, you know, I guess you could say litmus as to what's happening in the marketplace here. But in the end, when we start doing a deep dive, you sort of realize that the numbers that we're talking about are always less than what they really are. And that's also with the housing narrative. So um, obviously, if, you know, 3 million or up to 10 million homes are, are distressed and going through the foreclosure process, that will impact the housing market. That will impact the housing market from a negative perspective with the distress, but then from a positive perspective of, of bringing more opportunities to the table for everyday people like you and me and also driving price points down. Okay, but now cue the housing narrative. And here's what we've been hearing uh, since the pandemic has started, since we had forbearance and, and things like that. The, the housing hype people are saying, we're not going to have any issues because, number one, we have low interest rates still. Um, we have low inventory. We have more buyers that are out there. Home home builders can't build. So people will always be driving prices forward. And people who are facing uh, and are, are delinquent in their mortgage or are in forbearance or facing foreclosure right now, what they're simply going to do is sell because of all this new equity that they have. Okay, That's going to solve the problem. So there's nothing to worry about. Rest assured, all right? That's the first part of the narrative. The second part of the narrative is this. Well, if they're not selling, they want to remain in their homes, they're going to talk to their lender, all right? Because their lender has programs, the government's created programs, there's all sorts of cool things they're going to do to save your house. They're going to take that money, the forbearance volume and, or, or value, and put the back end of the loan. They're going to do all these cool things for you, um, and they're going to do that with workouts and loan modifications. So again, nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. That's what they're telling us in the current housing narrative. So if you want to believe that, good for you. 
you know I don't, and and there's reasons why, and that's part of my role here is to is to debunk that and, and sort of put the realism back in real estate. So um, if we really go into it and and find out you know what's happening, well we get these little nuggets of articles, and and, and they're helpful to a certain point, but they also raise a lot of questions. So this just came out the other day: many delinquent borrowers in loss mitigation aren't paying. And for this for for those of you that don't know, the term loss mitigation is typically the department at your bank, lender, or servicing company that handles people in distress. You're not paying your mortgage, you're going to go and talk to the loss mitigation department and they're going to give you solutions. Those solutions are do a loan modification that has to be approved or some workout problem program they have for you that has to be approved, you got to be approved to get into it. So, so there's financial requirements on income and things like that. Um, or you can do a short sale, which they'll, they'll respond to and help you. Or you can do what's called um, giving the property back. Sometimes people refer to this as cash for keys, but it's really called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So you're, you're, you're basically um, voluntarily giving the deed to um, your lender in lieu of not foreclosing on you, but when you do that, it actually still comes on your credit as a foreclosure, believe it or not. So there's no benefit to you to doing that. So anyway, just want to make sure that's what loss mitigation is about. Dealing, so the department that deals with all the distress, which is who we speak with. So when we're doing our short sales and we're negotiating with your lender, servicer, bank, whatever, we're talking to those people in that loss mitigation department and trying to work out deals. That's what we do. So. Um, just again, the, I want you to focus on the percentages we're going to talk about, not the peg count numbers, because again, the numbers are always going to be conservative, low uh, extrapolations of samples and samples. But the, the percentages would I would suggest would probably be consistent depending on whatever the number is. Okay, the peg count. So hundreds of thousands of borrowers, more than 90 days delinquent, uh, and, and in loss mitigation plans, aren't paying. A new study reveals. So across all investors, so we're talking FHA, VA, Fannie, Freddie. Uh, private mortgages, uh, well, whatever, like you know, conventional, whatever. Um, across all investors, you know, about nine hundred and sixty-four thousand mortgages remain seriously delinquent and not in forbearance, um, with forty-nine percent in loss mitigation plans as of February seventh. Okay, um, now of those people that are in loss mitigation, which means they've contacted their lender for help, seventy-two percent aren't paying. So I'm like, okay, so. That's interesting. So um, basically, um, you got seriously delinquent, not in forbearance. Um, half of those are in loss mitigation, and guess what? How, uh, Seventy-two percent aren't paying. So where is that going to go? Well, let's just sort of figure this out here because that is not um, conducive to successful loan modification. And you keep in your house, okay? So um, it's funny because they're reporting. You know, this this all sort of come to well. Um, let me go back here. They, everyone's talking about you know why this is different, etc. Um, you know um, the figure. The figures are, are different because of you know we've hit 2022, which basically means activity is going to happen now and uh, the foreclosure process is going to pick up. So really, um, they're talking about you know January filings are up 30 percent from the previous month. Um, since most of these forbearance plans will expire the next five months, the protections against foreclosure expired January 1st. We are at a critical phase in the last stage of the housing market recovery from the pandemic. Well, this I don't call this the last stage of the housing market recovery. I, I see this going into the slash crash, recession, whatever. Okay, this is not a recovery part. This is actually going into the first phase of, of the real big issues here. So FHA and Veterans Affairs had the most loans that were 90 days or more past due and not in forbearance. Okay. Um, and basically, um, of those, uh, I guess you could say, um, seriously delinquent, not in forbearance and in loss mitigation, 79% aren't paying. That's the highest rate uh, among investor portfolios. Fannie and Freddie had about 53% of, of not in loss mitigation, not paying. And borrowers with private label mortgage-backed securities and portfolio mortgages in the same status had non-paying rates of 76% and 71% uh, respectively. So let's point this out here. So you've gone to your lender. You're not in forbearance anymore. You've often like your forbearance is over. Now you're in the loss mint world, loss mitigation world. So now you got to do the workout programs or loan modifications. So maybe you've done one, or they haven't got to you yet. But the whole point is that you're not paying. So you're not in a pro like you know what I mean. Like you're you're in loss mitigation, but maybe it's not been solved yet, or the offer that they've made to you in loss mitigation doesn't work for you, so you haven't taken it. Or you know you've taken it, but you can't make payments. So don't forget, a lot of people who do loan modifications, fifty to sixty percent redefault. You know within a few months anyway. So it's not a good place to be in. But my point here is that this is not ten percent or twenty percent. 
This is what? 53, okay, percent. 76, 71, 79 percent. This is the majority. So the majority of these homes in this category are not paying, and that is problematic. So when I look at the current housing narrative, I go, what's going to happen, and everything's going to be okay, and are we going to believe that? Well, when you start looking at stuff like this, it's like, wait a second here. So all these things that, you know, forbearance will cure all of our problems. Well, it didn't. Okay, well, you'll sell with all your equity. Well, people aren't. Oh, well, then the lender's going to help you. Well, they're not, okay, or, or you're or you're not able to be helped or, or you're making decisions not to. So it's almost like every time there is a, you know, positive spin from the housing narrative talking about how this is all going to get solved, we uncover more and more things that are showing the exact opposite is actually happening right now. So, again, those of you who are naysayers and, and don't believe the hype or, or that I'm trying, my hype, I guess you could say, is that that's fine. I mean, we're all entitled to our opinion, and I don't, you know, that's, that's great, but... So the things are starting to shift the other way now, okay? This great, great, great opportunity to sell and cash out and move on, not really happening. And realize that I deal with homeowners. So I actually deal with people in their homes and what's going on, understand where they're coming from. So I actually understand, like I get to learn and, and, under, and you know, figure out why people are making decisions in certain ways, okay? And there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Typically, it's a cash flow problem, right? People don't know what to do. They can't get good advice. And they stay, and then they wait to the last minute before they trigger some sort of solution, and oftentimes it's too late, and they end up losing their home. So not a good thing. There are solutions, but just people got to approach it a different way. So just, again, uh, as I said, these numbers aren't 10 20%. They're, you know, the lowest is 53% of, of, of that um, Freddie and Fannie, and then you've got 79% for VA, FHA, and, you know, over 70% for, um, you know, private label MBS and, and, and portfolio mortgages, okay? So significant okay that's not little that's a significant number here and you know again as i said the pay counts may not be always accurate but the percentages are kind of you know you can kind of rely on those so uh for those of you who are watching the video and you're not a subscriber if you'd please smash that subscribe button and join i would be most appreciative and thank you very much and for those that are subscribers could you please double check hit the subscribe button again because i lose a lot of subscribers on a daily basis for reasons i don't know and no one will tell me so please if you just verify your subscription i'd appreciate that Thank you for the views and the patronage. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys. So if we delve deeper into this, um, as, as again, there's the two housing markets. So mainstream is talking about housing narrative, which is the you know double-digit appreciation and low interest rates and low inventory. And if you buy now, you're only going to make money. And that's what's going on. That that's 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 I guess that is that area of discussion, which is really mainstream retail is on market. So on market to me is in the MLS, listed on Zillow, um, kind of obvious, you know, your real estate agent's going to find you a property, okay? I talk about stuff like this distress things, which is really what we refer, refer to as the shadow market or shadow inventory. This is off market. Now, these homes aren't available. Not like they're sitting there going, hey, buy me, buy me. The, the difference is that they are they're going through problems and we have to connect with the homeowners to solve the problems to make them go on market or make them as deals or transactions. So just make sure we're all clear on that. So uh, interesting enough, though, when you start taking a look at some of these things, um, you know, we realize that, you know, we got to put the realism back in real estate, okay, because the narrative is great and the world is based on narratives these days and it's really debunking the narrative. So I'm going to debunk this one right now. So going to that, we'll sell with equity because we have all this equity and everything's going to be okay. Well, guess what? If you're not paying your mortgage for two years, three years, four years, whatever the number is right now, okay, and, and you still haven't solved that problem, it's because you have a cash flow issue. Whether it's income expenses, something unfortunate happening in your life, whatever, um, it, it's caused the problem. So a, a cash flow is the issue. Now, when, when we're talking about look at all this equity, so, um, you know, why wouldn't you put the home, your home on the market and get this equity and sell and cash out? Well, you know what? Um, you know, selling high, and I, I look at it going, getting that premium, you want to get that top equity, well, then your home better be in a situation where it can sell at a premium and get that high equity, which means, is your home updated? Do you have a new roof? Do you have a new kitchen, a new bathrooms? Do you got, you know, new amenities? You know, how, you know, is it freshly painted? Okay, have you got that curb appeal? So it's almost like to sell to get the big money, okay, you actually have to put money into it to bring it up. I have people in, in, in our, our local neighborhood here that they sold their homes, and before they sold their homes, they went and did the new roofs and did this and that and whatever to get it to a point where they know they're going to, that their their investment will return because they've sold at a premium based on the, the time, okay? So that you have to spend the money to give it the curb appeal. 
And people who are in the situation of not paying their mortgage don't necessarily have the extra money to do that, okay? And having roofs and bathrooms and kitchens updated are not $1,000. I mean, those are big ticket items, right? 20, 30, 40 grand each, right? To do these things, even more depending on where you're at. And you've now got um, material increases, labor increases, um, supply chain, all these things factor into that. So um, that's a cost that they don't really have. So also listing with the real estate agent. So when you've got, you want to put this on the MLS, you want to get the exposure. Uh, so guess what? That's going to be commission. 5% or 6% commission depends on where you are. You're going to pay off the, off the sale price. You've also got closing costs. Okay, closing costs are basic, you know, like document stamps, state transfer taxes, um, title insurance, all, all the things, prorations, tax, whatever, all those things that are involved in, in a closing transaction settlement statement type thing you normally would look at. So those come right off the sale price, right? Now, what happens if you, over the past few years, have taken are trying to sell to get out of this situation and you've got a loan down a low down payment loan maybe you took an fha loan you put five percent down or three and a half percent down well guess what when you start um going well you know what's my net proceeds going to be uh, minus um all my you know commissions and costs and stuff are you actually above water or underwater on your sale all depends i guess right and realize that you know over the number of months or years you have been paid that non-payment erodes the equity. So here's what happens when, when the, the, all these groups go look at the equity we have. They look at loan balance upon um, purchase. So say you purchased a home for five hundred thousand dollars, you took a three hundred and fifty k loan balance, okay, and now it's worth six hundred thousand um, dollars. They look and go, well, you've got six hundred uh, k uh, uh, value, three hundred and fifty k. Um, you know, loan. There's a, there's the difference is the equity. Well, the, you know that's that's very rudimentary math. Nobody is calculating and figuring out. Well, you haven't paid for two years or three years, so all that non-payment interest, charges, fees, lawyer fees, whatever, whatever, that adds up as well to chips into the into the um, you know what's what's old balance. So therefore, well, your your final balance increases your payoff, and therefore you erode your equity. So no one talks about that. So that's an issue. So when you start looking at how the realism works selling a property when you're distressed it's not ever it's not going to give you this necessarily this huge windfall all right and here's the other issue that we're seeing with people right now is that where do i go now so if you're in your home and you're not paying your mortgage that's kind of a comforting feeling because you're nothing's happening you're able to stay there you've had some government support of pushing stuff off for you uh and you're sitting there going I, i'm not paying so you adjust your lifestyle and expectations to not paying your mortgage well the minute you now sell you're going someplace else. you've got to find a place well you can't um you can't buy because you're not going to get a mortgage because you haven't paid your mortgage therefore you're not going to qualify for a mortgage your credit's going to get hurt and stuff like that so your only option is to rent so what does rent require? Rent requires first and or last month or or first and security deposit, and you got to move and pay that expenses and all those type of things, utility hooks up, hookups, whatever, all those things that go on. Well, rents have skyrocketed, right? We all know that rents are up big time in many metros across the country. So you're going to go from not paying to a sticker shock, paying a lot up front, and are you going to have all that money? Is that money going to last? So this is the whole point: is that people go, I don't want to do that. You know, what what am I going to do here? So that's problematic, right? So that's one of the reasons why um, you know that, that doesn't always work. The self for equity. Now on the um, lender will assist you. Well, guess what? You're coming out of your forbearance. You're going to jump into the loss mitigation platform or, or part of the servicing area, right? You're going to apply for a loan modification, which means you're going to fill out financials. You have to qualify for most of those programs. They look at money in, money out, monthly financial. Can you pay something or something towards you know your mortgage? Um, it's, they, they don't just accept what you can give. It has to work for a specific formula on, on, on how it plays out. And guess what? Um, the information is vague at best as to what they're offering. Um, most time it doesn't work. So remember, 51% of the people you know are, are either have not sought assistance for in loss mitigation, and we've got roughly what you know 70 you know plus percent on average are, are not paying. So what does that mean? So what happens next? Well, they fall into the foreclosure process, and then that that process starts and hurts them. So it's one of those things that you know if you can't sell because you have nowhere to go and you can't put the money into the property to, to give you that that you know uptick in the equity. Well, now you're trying to loan mod, and you can't loan mod because it doesn't work financially for 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 either party, and now you're going the foreclosure bucket. So you see. This is a typical scenario where it always ends up that the homeowner is going to, you know, lose in the end 
um, whether they're going to do a short sale and walk away with nothing or whether they're going to lose it via foreclosure and get hurt, you know, a double whammy on that. So it's a sad scene, but this is realism, okay, guys? This basically is realism. And I do want to point that out that, you know, I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news, but this is what's going on in the marketplace right now. And yeah, there's certain locations in the country that may have huge appreciation, uh, and that's great, uh, but the majority of people will, will find that they're, all, what they think they have is going to get compressed, all right? Um, I have shown these slides over the past few months, okay, actually in the past maybe year. Um, this, is, this comes from American Enterprise Institute's website. This is an FHA um, uh, produced, uh, or they have the information. Um, it, it's basically their sort of um, uh, their neighborhood watch. And they talk about, you know, most threatened metros and FHA loan delinquency. So um, I want to talk about the last one that they produced and they stopped producing it for whatever reason was September of um, 21, okay, end of September 2021, so last year. And we had uh, roughly, you know, almost a million FHA-based loans are uh, delinquent. We had a total delinquent loans of 13.1%, 8.5% are seriously delinquent, seriously delinquent meaning greater than 90 days or, or, or delinquent, okay? That's where it was, uh, and you got your top 10 metros, which are Atlanta, Houston, Chicago, Washington, Baltimore, Riverside, San Bernardino, Philadelphia, Orlando, Kissimmee, uh, Nassau County, Suffolk County, Long Island area, Camden, New Jersey, okay? Typical places that, you know, we know there's distress, we know there's volume there, the whole bit. And that's your, your, your 10 most threatened based on some of the ways they look at the data. Serious delinquencies, loan, uh, loan, um, counts and, and, and loan vintage, stuff like that, plus, you know, overall stuff. So a little bit of calculation how they do that. Well, the, so just I want to be clear here, they didn't produce a report for October, nor did they produce a report for November, because I've been looking for it over the past few months, didn't see it. So guess what? So they recently just released, literally last week, released this, and this was a report that was based on the end of the year, so December 31st. Well, guess what? The 10 most threatened metros suddenly changed dramatically, all right? So, we, yeah, we have Atlanta, who's still up there, and we have Camden, who's still up there. But now we have, you know, New Orleans, Gary, Indiana, Wilmington, New Haven, Connecticut, Mobile, Alabama, Shreveport, Louisiana, Corpus Christi, Texas, Flint, Michigan. So all the other, you know, Chicago areas, um, you know, Long Island, New York areas, Philadelphia, all the Kissimmee, like the big major cities that have these problems are no longer um, in seriously delinquent status. And they don't make the top 10 here of the most threatened metro. So I'm kind of going, why did, number one, we not see data for two months? Why did this suddenly just appear um, last week for the end of the year? And why is there such a big change with respect to the, the um, I guess you could say, the top 10. Like, that to me is really surprising because, listen, for example, I'll take the Chicago, Illinois area. It's huge, all right? And I, I have a good contact who actually uh, really is was one of the ownership in a data company there. And, you know, he, he tells me it's, you know, the, the data value is X and it's going to be triple that when things start happening and it's it's yes and a lot of other other you know places under report data so you know i know that you know the chicago should be up there but so what's changed okay so this is where you know the numbers don't the numbers not, don't necessarily work out and they don't jive with what we're being told etc so I, i'm just making that as a point you can believe what you want to believe um interesting enough when we take a look at this um you know this is the website and you know the, so they put you know the, that the the image that says risk with the the um, sand timer thing. Um, you know, we've got, you know, August, July, September, and then we have December. So we're missing two months. So don't ask me why they just skipped two months. I don't understand that. So I just want to let you know that it was not available. It wasn't there. I've been looking for it. Um, you know, it, it, you can, the, what, what I show you is that top 10 kind of chart. You can download the actual um, spreadsheet for the 169 metro locations across the country. Go to the website, aei.org. Type in delinquencies. You'll, you'll hit that eventually. You can download it right there. It's free, um, and you can see what the numbers are here. So I'm looking kind of going, okay, well, uh, uh, you know, it makes sense. So, so what's what's the big difference here? And and I'm kind of going like I don't understand what how this could change because we went from September to December. We saw some big number changes, and that was a concern to me. I'm like, what's going on? Is there some shell game happening? Whatever. So I just did some screenshots. So the first. First block chart there is September. The second is December. So we can take a look at, well, you know, where I have the red circle is that that's the total delinquent loans for FHA. So the top one is September, which is 980,000. 
the, the bottom one is end of December, which is 832,000. So we basically, so the difference is we've gone from 980K loans, FHA loans to 832K. That's a difference there. So the total delinquent, percentage delinquent's gone from 13.1 to 11.3, all right? And then our seriously delinquent went from 8.5% of the loans to 6.2, all right? That, that, that's, that's overall across the board, not, not metro specific. That's the overall number across the board, okay, across the country. So what's the deal here? Why has that changed? I'm kind of going, does it make sense? Now, yeah, you know, people can sell. That's great. So we basically went from 980 to 832. So so I guess I have to assume that, um, you know, could you make the assumption that, you know, that's 100 and what? Just say 100 and, you know, 150. Did 150 FHA homes um, sell in uh, the, the past two months? Well, I guess it could have, you know, October, November, December, maybe three months. Okay, could that have sold? Could there be 50,000 homes across the country that are FHA loans that were in distress that transacted to, to get them out of the mess? Possibly, all right, but maybe there's something else on, on the go here. So, um, you know, just to me, this doesn't quite make sense, the numbers. Um, so rem I think this is where it came, though. Like, so uh, don't forget, you know, starting um, at the, you know, uh, July or August of, of 2021 is when the forbearance plans were also opening up, okay? They're, they were ending, I guess you could say. So, you know, we're moving from forbearance bucket to loss mitigation bucket. So I guess the question is, you know, is that making a change? Like, in other words, is is the reporting of that now causing, you know, the delinquency stuff to to drop off on that chart and that, you know, with how FHA reports it, but sort of be in limbo somewhere else? Like, in other words, if I'm in loss mitigation, then I'm essentially back on track maybe um, with my mortgage, or maybe I'm in a different category that's not a delinquent category. I don't know yet. Okay, I'm not too sure about that. So realize that they've always talked about you know the two million forbearance number. Okay, of two two million people in forbearance, which we know is actually more than that. Again, the forbearance number is um, is extrapolation of a sample of the sample, etc. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, we know that 1.2 million forbearance programs were going to expire or end between. You know, August of 2021 to the end of the year of, of 2021, 1.2 million, and then there's another 800,000 that are expiring the first six months of this year. Okay, so that's about that's about your two million. Okay, so just realize, think about those numbers. Now we go to well, if I go back to the beginning, 51% of delinquent loans are not in any loss mitigation program. Okay, great. 72% of those in a loss mitigation program are not paying. So what's going to happen now? So you can see that like the numbers aren't kind of adding up here. Okay, like where did all those, you know, suddenly, you know, did all the top 10, why, why did eight of the top 10 FHA delinquency um, locations suddenly change to much smaller locations, all right? Um, you know, did, did 150,000, um, you know, FHA loans that disappeared from the previous chart, um, did, were they all sales in those top 10 um, locations and made a big difference? I don't think so. So my, my whole point is that, you know, when you look at the numbers, they don't really add up. But this is designed to make you think, okay? And because we forget about this. So when we're talking about it and we're right into all the information, yeah, we get it, we know about it. But then a few months go by, reports don't come out, things get moved around a little bit. You know, it doesn't it doesn't seem to make sense. I look at it going, listen, if a dump truck comes um, and dumps a, a ton of dirt on your driveway because uh, you're going to put in your flower garden or whatever, um, the ton of dirt's on your driveway, you over the weekend take your wheelbarrow and you distribute that dirt to all the flower beds and gardens in your in your in your home. You still moved a ton of dirt. It's just not all one big pile. You can see, right? So basically, um, this is I think this is where we're going to start seeing some shell games and some just some finessing of numbers to make it seem like it's not as bad as it actually is. So that that's how I look at this. I could be 100% wrong. There could be things I don't know, but just at face value, I'm scratching my head, going, where do all these numbers come from? And, and, you know, when we take a look at, you know, when we look about, like, like, like the negative numbers, like, like in other words, 51% delinquent, not in any program, 72% in a program, not paying, like in other words, there's a lot of nots and no's and aren'ts, as opposed to getting taken care of and, and solving problems and, and, and coming out successfully, you see, we're, we're on the other end, as opposed to the positive end here. So for us, in the end, you know, that's, you know, I guess you said the net result should be more distress. Uh, put you know more inventory coming, pushing property prices down as more as more distress comes in the market. But again, every so often it's a time to slap ourselves in the face and go, let's get a little dose of realism here because the narrative doesn't seem to make sense, or the, the narrative is a great narrative if it all works. 
the realism uh, behind the scenes goes, a lot of it, you know, can't work. Yeah, if you can sell your home and walk away, good for you. But a lot of people are stuck. And again, I deal with people who are in these situations, and I know I know what they're telling me and what their fears are and their concerns are. So again, you just got to take it for face value. So there there is opportunities out there, guys. So just got to keep that in mind. So again, as I mentioned, you know, connect with me. I'm doing a build to rent, build to flip program. Um, got a training program. It's going to be an eight week training program called the Stress Deal Architect. So we got a few spots available. Basically, I'm going to start that in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've got some prelim training for you right now, and you can jump on board, and we can get going on that, and we'll have formally start in a couple of weeks on my weekly training for that. Obviously, my short sale program, the last call, it's getting shelved for a number of reasons, uh, new stuff in the future, so the best opportunity to get the program is now, to be quite honest with you. Uh, people are interested in, uh, because I think a lot of people who are looking at the market now realize that, yeah, we've now gone past what I call the inflection point, and now we're going to see uh, some things changing. Let's let's get on, on board and you know be ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, beating the masses to it. That's sort of my perspective. Um, you know, keeping that in mind, um, there's lots of deals out there. Uh, as we get more into this distressed market and more become available and you get your hands on stuff, there will be price points and there will be discounts given and there will be ways that you can do that. I mean, this is an example I like to use. It's a, it's a good example. That's why I use it. But it just goes to show that, you know, in, an, in a market where I live that has high appreciation, you know, high rent appreciation, uh, low inventory, we're still able to pull off a pretty massive discount here because we know how to control a deal, we know how to work through a deal, okay? Uh, so this also debunks the fact that, you know, there's no need for things like short sales or distressed sales. Well, no, there is, because um, not every home can just be sold, simple as that, all right? Um, you know, where it is now, I mean, it's probably worth 400 grand right now, fixed up, so there you go. So numbers are still moving up, it's gonna, it's plateauing. Interest rates, we've seen some, some increases, they'll decrease recently, so we'll see how that plays out. But in the end, it's all about the foreclosure volume, it's on its way, and as I say, every every video, it's taking its time. We get there, but now it's actually in in a position where the process is starting. All right, so that's what's going on. Hey, I'm working on something here. It's a it's a townhome development project. If, if investors want to be involved in this, please let me know. We're going through the numbers right now. All right, guys. So uh, again, I want to thank you for your views, likes, and comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber. I'd appreciate that. Reach out to me. If you have questions on programs, investing, opportunities, whatever, that's my email. And we'll look forward to talking to you in a couple of days. See you later.